Hello and welcome to our second AEC Tech TV show. My name is Arni Heiskanen and I'm a construction innovation agent based in Helsinki, Finland. And hello, I'm Paul Wilkinson, a technology consultant, writer, blogger and journalist, and I'm based in London. AEC Tech TV is a magazine show covering technologies used in architecture, engineering and construction industries. And coming up in today's show, I will be talking about the international BIM standards and the UK BIM framework. Then we have two COVID-19 items. Arnie will be talking about a research report on COVID-19 and construction. And the Digit Group's Paul Doherty gives his views on COVID-19. Rib Nordic's Nicholas Holst shows off the new Connex BIM mobile viewer. Robert Salvador describes DigiBuild in our startup spotlight. And we will be looking ahead to a virtual hackathon with Martin Polycarpos. Thank you, Paul. What has grabbed your attention this week? Today, Arnie, I want to talk about BIM, Building Information Modelling and Standards. This follows the publication recently of the latest edition of guidance that forms part of the UK BIM framework. Standards are quite fundamental to the ways in which we work. They provide an agreed way of doing something. They distill the wisdom of experts in a subject matter area and they reflect the needs of organisations that need to do things. That knowledge drives innovation, increases productivity and it makes people's lives easier, safer and healthier. Standards enable people to share their same expectations about a product or service or process such as building information modelling and they constantly evolve. New standards emerge as new technologies and new processes evolve and that's what we've been seeing with BIM. BIM as a concept has been around since the 1970s and 1980s but the term only really entered popular use from the early 2000s onwards. Today it's increasingly also defined by new standards. BIM is defined in ISO 19650 as use of a shared digital representation of a built asset to facilitate design, construction and operation processes to form a reliable basis for decisions. That reliable basis uh, is important because BIM can also be defined as better information management. And that is an opportunity for us to improve productivity through delivering faster at lower cost with lower greenhouse gas emissions and to make businesses and economies more competitive. After 2008-9, the global financial crisis, the UK's chief construction advisor, Paul Morell, urged BIM adoption on the UK government construction projects. He set a target date for all central government projects of April 2016. So-called Level 2 BIM was defined by a suite of documents, tools and prototype standards. Uh, these were publicly available specifications or PASs. And parts of the PAS 1192 suite uh, now form the basis of international standards and they've helped widen BIM adoption in the UK. International asset owners and operators have recognised the benefits and they've begun to require some of the same standards on their projects, but they didn't want to work to UK standards. So the International Organisation for Standardisation, ISO, was approached to elevate the UK 1192 series to an international level. The first two parts of ISO 19650 were published almost two years ago. This covered the concepts of BIM and also the use of BIM in the project delivery, the design into construction phases. In 2020, we've seen two further parts published. We've seen part five, which covers security, and we've seen part three, which covers the asset operational phase. However, as with many national standards, interpretation is everything. So country specific guidance has been created. This has been regularly updated in the UK since the early part of 2019. And in, in October 2019, the UK BIM framework 
um, came into being. This provides links to all of those standards, but also supporting guidance and is free to download. It's, it's a great resource for those wanting to get to grips with how they implement BIM on their projects. The UK BIM framework is the overarching approach to implementing BIM in the UK. It integrates the international 19650 series into UK practices and procedure. And it's backed by three organisations, the Centre for Digital Built Britain, BSI and the UK BIM Alliance and I'm a member of the executive team of the Alliance. Um, this growing volume of guidance has recently been rationalised. You have the concepts at the tops, then you have a series of documents covering delivery, the operational phase and then parts four and five. The part four will be about information handover, part five is the security piece. And then there's a suite of six guidance notes. For example, guidance D, D talks about talks to practitioners um, about defining and managing information requirements, including organisational, asset and project level requirements. And it also provides a video and database example, so we're no longer just talking about document based guidance. OK, Paul, um, do you think that uh, standards slow down innovation, as some suggest, because they always lag behind the development of technology? I think the, the, there are pros and cons. Um, I think the, the real opportunity for standards is to build a common platform for people to share information in consistent ways. Um, I think that does foster innovation. It enables more people to share ways in it, to share information in a much more consistent manner um, and build wide, wide scale innovation rather than having point innovation by people developing stuff based on proprietary working. All right. So but how to make software developers embrace standards if they're not already doing it? I think if the um, owners and operators in particular start demanding um, open standards, um, particularly because they've got to operate and maintain their facilities for decades. They're going to need data which is going to be consistent for a long period of time. Um, so uh, this puts pressure on software vendors and others to comply with those standards so that their technologies support um, those owner operators for the long term. In AC Tech TV today, we have two items relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has affected the construction industry in many ways. Mainly it has caused a lot of trouble, but there's no evidence that the necessary reconfiguration of construction sites has led to improvements in performance. Loughborough University in the UK studied six construction projects and five main sites. A report titled COVID-19 and Construction – Early Lessons for a New Normal summarizes the results of the research. The report is written by Wendy Jones, Vivian Chow and Alistair Gibb and was published in August. The research was commissioned by six construction sector firms to provide a rapid snapshot of the impact of COVID-19 on construction. The layouts and working practices on the sites of the companies have seen substantial changes in a short space of time and these changes have been successful and generally well received. As a result, the productivity of construction workers has increased. Furthermore, there has been a perceivable improvement in safety and health and site tidiness. I want to highlight the improvements in productivity. Someone is quoted as saying 50% workforce reduction but only 30% reduction in output. And another quote, with the productivity and the new ways of thinking, we believe we only need seven and a half people to do the same as ten people. What has made this possible? Earlier research by Arthur University used IoT and video data and found out uh, that typical construction workers are able to do value adding work a mere 30% of their time. Other pilot projects uh, with construction firms have been able to reduce production time by 50% with lean construction methods. And this seems to be the case here as well. The Loughborough researchers reported better and more detailed planning, just-in-time procurement and smart work sequencing. 
As for productivity improvements, they point out several factors. Better and more detailed task planning, more space, fewer people and less overlap in trades in the workplace, better planning by workers, for example preparation of workplaces, tools and materials, less double handing of materials, fewer people hanging around waiting to start work and tasks, more streamlined workflow, people chatting less, less talking on, on phones and so on. Technology has also helped, for example, by enabling remote meetings. Camera and video techniques allow remote reviews, project process monitoring, remote training and so on. The authors conclude that the construction sector has adapted to the challenges of COVID-19, presenting flexibility, resilience and ability to solve problems. Several projects have moved forward with innovations which might otherwise have taken several years to embed. Many have raised their game and challenged some conventional thinking about the ways in which projects are planned and undertaken. Okay, uh, Arne, the the practices that we've seen develop in the in recent times are these set to become normal practice um, for the long term? Yes, I think that uh, what we have seen now is basically uh, what people have been uh, talking about for years, namely lean construction, and that's something that I'm sure that will be become more uh, popular as we move forward. Thanks for that, Arnie. Are there any particular COVID challenges that, that are facing uh, particular construction disciplines? I'm thinking in particular, uh, looking at uh, air conditioning, uh, air conditioning in enclosed spaces. Very much, yes. Um, in fact, this is covered in, a, in an interview I did with Port Doherty a while ago. Paul Doherty is an architect and real estate developer and founder and chairman of the Digit Group, an organization heavily involved in smart cities developments. So when this entire pandemic uh, started to emerge, uh, I had a, a very interesting experience in that my wife is from Wuhan uh, and my mother-in-law uh, lives with us. She moved from Wuhan into the United States. Uh, and she's a retired nurse at Wuhan General Hospital. So in order to keep touch with our family, uh, they always have an 8 p.m. Uh, U.S. time uh, phone call on Skype and our dining room table. And from December into January, uh, we were receiving some very distressing news, both from our family and from my mother-in-law's former colleagues, doctors and nurses in Wuhan that by the end of January, uh, we were hearing of just horrendous death rates uh, that are still not accurate in our opinion of what we heard, what was going on in Wuhan uh, from the Chinese central government. So we started to actually prepare uh, in, in our own personal way. Uh, and what we discovered uh, then over time is, as the wave hit uh, the, the US, uh, was that how unprepared everyone was. Um, and because what well, we've never really experienced in almost a century, you know, a global pandemic and now, especially with the interconnectivity of globalization, especially with our industry, the AC industry, uh, we immediately went to work. Um, we, our staff started to reassess immediately uh, what was this thing from a science and data aspect, not from opinion, not from politics, but what was the science and the data? And we spent a good amount of time diving in and researching uh, what this thing was. And we're still researching. Uh, but what we have discovered are some major principles uh, that I'd like to share uh, based upon our age of the pandemic. This isn't just about COVID-19. Uh, this is actually a strain of a virus that emerged in our consciousness in 2003 called SARS that there's still no cure for. So we went to work and started to take a look at what uh, the United States Center for Disease Control was doing, the CDC, uh, and then the sharing of information through the WHO and other European, uh, Asian, uh, and African uh, institutes. And what we found uh, was that our industry and the way that we actually perform and implement things like mechanical systems are partly a big issue of the spread of virus and not just COVID-19, but pandemic level type of 
viruses, because we need now to be prepared. COVID-19 was a warning shot. These next viruses are gonna get more and more and more intense. So as humans, what should be our response? So when we took a look at the mechanical systems, <clears throat> we also uh, saw that there was human behavior issues. Uh, you know, there, and a lot of that again has to do with localization. Uh, except that when we then put it up into the level of taking a look at it as a global industry, uh, we realized that we needed to change our behaviors, especially for the people in the field. That we need to eliminate uncertainty. That's the big issue. Uh, here in the U.S., if you have a superintendent or, or a foreman of a subtrade, let's call it a, 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 a plumbing company, this person has to go around to different job sites on a given day. On one job site, they're probably very strict. They may have the, the uh, touchless thermometer, mask requirements, compliance officers, make, uh, social distancing. Go on to the next job site right down the road, there's no discipline at all. People walk around without masks, no social distancing, that type of thing. So that's one big thing that we're doing with our projects is that we're changing our general conditions of the contract uh, so that we are adhering in the same way for uh, occupational safety and health requirements, except they're not published yet, but it's responsibility of an organization like ours that's a real estate developer, the owner, to communicate with the design team, to communicate with the construction team, that these are the base minimum requirements, the same way that you need to have porta potties. This is a human condition, right? So eliminating uncertainty is a big piece. And again, that's more behavioral and contractual that can be managed. The second big piece we saw was how the designers are really trying to help businesses. No one wants to see the global economy closed. So what we found is that the mechanical systems and the way that the CDC in the US have studied both restaurants, retail, and open office plans for commercial office buildings is the spread of case studies. And what we found was this, the way that we design our mechanical systems uh, is very um, prehistoric, would be one way of saying it, that, you know, the focus in on air quality and trying to save energy, that was something that a lot of organizations, but what we found is that then when we went to the implementation, building automation systems and building management systems, the air quality for safety and health was always a secondary element. It was about saving that energy for money. What's the ROI, especially to facility managers, which meant that the biggest complaint around the world for every space, every building, is that it's too hot or it's too cold. It doesn't matter if it's a bedroom or a ballroom. So when we started taking a look at these studies, we saw that the spread happened because of the way that the airflow came out of the vent systems. Right? <clears throat> so we then went backwards into the layout of the mechanical systems, either through dampers and VAV boxes, about how that either pushes heat or cool air into a space. So the first thing that we then did was that we went back into the air handling units. How do you capture air and can that be sterilized so that you're at least starting a risk mitigation process of pumping clean air into the space? And do what we found, Arnie, mm -hmm. that the air intake, the fresh air intakes in the majority of buildings inside of CBDs in major urban environments are at street level. What are we thinking? So designers, please, 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 start rethinking where the fresh air is and stick your fresh air intake where it is because we think, oh my God, this building's sick. We don't know why it's sick. One big reason why it's sick is because by 2 p.m., all the exhaust of all the buses and cars are coming right into your building. So let's start thinking smart. And I think that's a big thing that we learned is we were so busy as a global economy up until March of 2020, when COVID hit, that we were very tactical. We're in the COVID gym right now, Arnie, where we now have the opportunity, we're being given the gift of thinking strategically while also thinking tactically. So thinking through how you move air into a facility, fresh air intake, sterilize the air, either through UV or, or other uh, methods. But the big problem is people, we're the contaminants. So when you're in the space, either in a bedroom or a ballroom. What we found is that we're seeing different types of solutions. One of them is actually from the UK called Oero, that is taking a look at how to create ambient air temperatures by taking the existing mechanical systems and using not all on or all off for pushing air through the duct systems, but by pressurizing 
the duct systems. Officially creating an air pressurization that you're not blowing air, which then the, the vents will then you know, spew it around in an airflow, but creating ambient air pressure so that if you want 18 degrees centigrade in that room, a bedroom or a ballroom, the number one complaint of it's too hot, it's too cold goes away. And the big thing it does is that it then takes air droplets that come off of a human being and it does not allow, because the chaos of pressurization, those droplets to go more than 20 centimeters from your face until it drops 90 degrees onto a surface. Does it get rid of COVID? That's not what we're trying to do. It's how do we rethink strategically and tactically the layout of our mechanical systems so that we are still either operating or delivering safe buildings. That was Paul Doherty talking about COVID-19. Next, we showcase a product launched just last week. Rib Nordic from Copenhagen in Denmark launched its Connex BIM platform, which features a mobile app that helps users view their building information model and even walk through or fly through their building. Nicholas Holst explains more. Hello and welcome. My name is Nicholas Holst and I'm the Chief Product Officer for RIB Nordics based out of Copenhagen, Denmark. And I'm th thankful for getting this opportunity to talk to you about our newly developed application Connects BIM. Connects BIM is our interactive BIM viewer that allows you to bring your 3D design material to life on your construction projects. We have started out focusing on developing a mobile application for both iOS and Android, enabling you to bring your 3D BIM design material to life on the construction site by putting it into the hands of the contractors and the subcontractors on your construction project. They will be able to leverage our fully integrated workflow engine and execute request for information, design issues, non-conformity reports, variation orders, or your own customly designed and configured workflow directly at their fingertips while interacting with the 3D model. Connect BIM is your mobile BIM application that allows you to better understand constructability issues while being on the construction site and driving better decisions making. We have also developed a proprietary algorithm that can automatically analyze the data model within the IFC file and generate the location structure of that particular model automatically. It also generates an automatically created 2D plan for each of the levels in the IFC model, which allows you to do fast and efficient registrations of the tasks. And you can also leverage this for fast and efficient navigation while being inside the 3D model. You can leverage a number of different 3D actions to interrogate the BIM model and better understand constructability issues. And we have focused on developing a gamified and intuitive navigation while you're inside the BIM viewer. As I also mentioned earlier, the solution is fully integrated with our process management solution in Connex, so you can set up your own custom workflows or you can leverage some of the standard RIB workflows that we have designed for you. Just sit back and let me take you through an actual demonstration of Connex BIM inside the mobile application. So what you see here is a Connex Mobile. And Connects Mobile on the landing page, you can see all the various different projects that you have access to. This particular user is <clears throat> I have logged in with is a client that has access to many different type of projects. And opening our demo project, you will see a task list. This task list uh, is a um, is accumulating all of the various tasks that have that you have access to on this particular project across various different type of workflows that you're working on. So it becomes a condensed to-do list that is ordered in chronological order. So you can see here the tasks that are overdue for today or for tomorrow or sometime in the future. And you can also leverage different type of filters up here in the top to filter for particular groups in the project <clears throat> that have access to different tasks. So in this particular example, I'm interested in inspecting a client decision that has been sent forth to me 
from the HVAC engineer proposing to reroute the technical installations uh, for the ventilation ducts instead of uh, going through the concrete walls, which was the original design. So searching for this particular uh, task, um, I will say here HVAC, and I'm opening this client decision that has been assigned to me. I'm now able to inspect the data of this particular task. I can see who has created it and when, and I can read the description. And what we also allow the users to do inside of Connects is to link different type of tasks originating from different workflows together. And this is particularly important because on construction projects, you have many interrelated and interdependent tasks happening at the same time, and it's very important to keep a clear audit trail of how these different processes have unintended consequences for each other. So here I can see that this decision, this client decision that has been sent forth to me, is linked to a variation order. And by clicking on this variation order, I as a client will now be able to better understand the underlying reasons for this proposed design change. Here I can read the details of why the HVAC engineer proposes to reroute the dock. I can see that there are some proposed work procedures and a cover letter. And I can also see that this particular variation order is linked to a request for information. I can drill into this request for information and I can see that it has been created by the, it was originally created by the subcontractor and now sent to the main contractor. Uh, and looking into this tasks, it will become evident for me that the subcontractor for the HVAC installations saw that there was missing concrete coring in the, in the, in the concrete wall um, in order to route the ventilation stock through the walls, and therefore they are proposing to reroute the ducts around the wall instead. So I'm also able to inspect uh, the comments that are made on the task, so I can see the dialogue that is going back and forth between the various involved stakeholders, and I'm also able to inspect the detailed lock of the task that captures all of the different actions on the task that has happened. Now, being a very curious um, um, client, I will go into the 3D model to inspect this particular place in the 3D model and understand how it looks like. So I'm clicking on the location reference on this particular task, which will now direct me into the model. So what you can see here is I'm now opening the BIM model. I'm able to navigate towards the place of interest. I can hide the false ceiling and I can conclude that this particular pipe, this particular duct is clashing with the, the concrete wall. I can also cut through the wall so I can inspect that there is actually a clash between the two. And I can reset the model so it becomes, uh, so it's easy to go back to the original uh, uh, view of the model here. So here you can see that uh, there is no coring between, uh, or there is no coring in the concrete slab for the ventilation duct. And since I'm a very curious client, I also want to see if this particular issue is uh, occurring on the other side of the building. Here I can leverage the minimap, which I can also collapse here to actually teleport to the other end of the building by clicking inside of the map. I will go to the other end of the building. I can of course see how my user is oriented by also looking at the minimap and by clicking on the fall ceiling, I can hide this as well and see that we do also have a clash in this particular end of the building. I want to check if we have the same issue on the second floor, which I can do by leveraging the inbuilt location structure here. I can go to the second floor and open the office area, which will take me to the second floor just above me, and I'm able to see and inspect for further details here. Clicking on the false ceiling, oh, sorry. Clicking on the false ceiling, I can hide it, and I can see that I don't have the same issue 
uh, as I did on the first floor. I can also rotate and go into landscape mode, which will enable these joysticks to come uh, out. And I can leverage this very intuitive and gamified experience for walking through the model and inspecting uh, constructability issues. Here I can again hide um, the, um, the fall ceiling and see that here the routing of the docks is, is working just fine. I'm also able to create a new issue if I want to by interacting with, a, um, with an object and clicking on the create tasks. And since I'm a project, uh, since I'm a client here, I will only be able to uh, create a client change. Uh, sorry for this particular workflow being in Danish, but clicking on this will create a task and a small snippet of this uh, area and also pre-fill the location for this particular task. So this was a very brief introduction of how Connect BIM enables you to bring your 3D design material to life on your construction project. I hope you enjoyed it and please reach out if you have any questions or are interested in trying out Connect BIM. Thank you very much. much. And that was Nicholas Holst of RIB in Denmark. Next, Robert Salvador talks us about his startup DigiBuild. Bringing a blockchain solution is something that we believe can be game-changing in the long term for our industry. Um, we foresee an industry where construction projects are and their participants are connected by blockchain, um, making it much more efficient, much more transparent, um, and just overall a better system when you have a blockchain on the back end that introduces a form of digital trust. Um, you know, right now we spend a lot of time and money and manpower trying to establish trust between our companies. And when you can inject a digital trust, a medium that brings trust to the forefront um, without any of these you know, multiple other steps that currently are required, um, it can have very big benefits for our industry. And that's where we see DigiBuild going long-term, being a construction management platform that brings blockchain um, to multiple areas within the industry. Now, in the short term, we recognize the importance of bringing a product to market that provides direct value in the here and now for construction companies. So in the short term, what we're doing is working on three key pieces that we've identified with our clients, our major pain points that they would like to see solved, and our major pain points that blockchain plays well into. So the three things that we're working on in the short term are productivity, supply chain, and payments. What we want to do is bring the ultimate review tool uh, to construction projects and that's what we're building out with our productivity tool. Taking a blockchain and connecting it to all the different mediums where companies store data and removing all of the pain that occurs trying to review data, find data. Um, you know, construction projects, they create a lot of documents. Uh, on an average construction project, a large construction project, about 750,000 documents will be created. Um, and then many of those documents get reviewed multiple times. So there's very powerful data out there that shows about $180 billion per year is wasted by our project teams searching for and reviewing items that they've seen in the past that they just can't find or uh, with it. So our first tool is essentially Google for your construction project or your construction company. And we're very excited about that. The next thing we're building out, um, right now in construction supply chains are very fragmented, very inefficient. Uh, the process of ordering, documenting, and tracking material from supplier to the job site is very broken and very inefficient. So blockchain enabling a way to track those items to the site and enabling a single place where suppliers and contractors and specialty contractors can interact together is something that um, all of our beta users and companies that we're working with have identified as a pain point and something that they're excited to see us solve. And finally, we're building a payments tool uh, for the construction industry. Again, the same concept as, as before, you have all these different parties transacting across you know, different silos, you know, their data is siloed, and we're utilizing all these different platforms. 
So by plugging in a blockchain network to that, we can speed up payments. We can remove a lot of the inefficiencies in payments you know, by automating a lot of the data collection processes. And overall, we can offer benefits that get the lower tier parties uh, paid faster and allow them to you know, apply for payments in a cheaper way. And the upper tier parties that need to have their risk managed, developers, general contractors, lenders, um, they get more transparency and visibility into um, you know, the risk management and into who is owed what on their construction projects. So overall, we foresee blockchain being a very powerful tool. And short term, we're building out tools that can benefit the industry now. Um, we're building out integrations with some of the leading software providers so that we can seamlessly provide these tools um, without asking the construction companies that we're working with um, to, you know, to transition or to do any type of, of major overhaul in order to use our products. Once the short term products come to market and start adding value to the industry, that's where we're going to increase our suite of tools that are enabled by blockchain and eventually, like I said, bring forward a project that is connected by blockchain that has all of these different relationships and um, transactions being backed up by a blockchain which across the board allow for um, efficiency gains, allow for uh, more managing of risk, uh, and just allow us to spend less time trying to build audit trails and paperwork and all of these ancillary things and allow our project teams to spend more time doing what they need to do and what matters to us construction workers and to us construction companies, which is managing the schedule and managing the budget. Um, and I think the, the thing we're most proud of here at DigiBuild is that as a team, we've built over $5 billion worth of construction projects over the years. Um, so we understand the intricacies of the workflows. We understand the stakeholders involved in those workflows, and we understand how to build a software that makes those workflows easier and less stressful. And that's why we're proud to be by builders for builders. That was Robert Salvador from DigiBuild. Remember, AEC Tech is a weekly show. We already have some content ready for next week, but we really want your ideas and suggestions and better still, your contributions. Looking further ahead, Arnie, uh, what events are coming up from, uh, uh, from your point of view? Actually, I let Martin Polycarpers explain the uh, upcoming hackathon Well, I'm, um, I'm a member of the board in this uh, digital uh, construction cluster uh, we have. And um, I'm also responsible for organization of this uh, Karas uh, 48 event, digital construction. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, in other life, uh, I work for a Swiss company and uh, called SIGA, and I'm there responsible for application engineering department. So it's uh, and uh, the reason why we we as a company are in this digital construction cluster is that uh, digitalization in the whole building industry uh, is uh, the level of digitalization is quite low, and we as a building material producers uh, also see the value in uh, digitalization and uh, uh, of the data which we have. Well, the. Um, Organizers of this uh, event are um, uh, Estonian uh, Digital Construction Cluster and Garage um, 48. And in addition, also one of the organization's uh, uh, committee members are the Estonian uh, Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs, uh, who see, uh, they also see, as you know, in Estonia, um, uh, the digitalization level in the governmental uh, uh, areas is uh, quite high and uh, also they want to uh, do the next step in the digitalization of the construction industry. That's why the Ministry of Economic Affairs is also one uh, organizer. And the reason why we um, organize this event is that uh, there are uh, many, many challenges uh, in the construction industry. Um, for example, the lacking of uh, digitalization and overall process, the information exchange uh, throughout the uh, uh, construction industry is lacking and also the low productivity and profitability which uh, uh, which could be easily uh, changed with the digital solutions 
Well, there are, um, we expect the participants to have a um, sort of a, a problem or challenge which they want to solve. Um, it can be in, from their daily businesses uh, or, uh, or they see in a bigger picture uh, some problems which could uh, solve uh, or some not problems, but some solutions which could solve the problems uh, through uh, the whole life cycle of the building industry. So the participants normally are uh, companies uh, or, or individuals who has their idea. Uh, and also the, the, the other participants who will form the team uh, should have a certain expertise. Uh, for example, as we are talking about digital part and uh, programmers, for example, um, uh, designers, uh, user experience uh, experts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we expect uh, people, the background of, uh, of these participants uh, is uh, sort of building industry and IT. So we put them together in this Garage 48 the hackathon. Total online, uh, no one is, um, of course, we can't restrict uh, people meeting, uh, teams meeting uh, in real life, uh, but the whole event is uh, happening online, uh, in, uh, in the online environment. All the communication is online. The mentors uh, will uh, support the teams online. Uh, so it's everything completely online. Well, we have uh, the Estonian uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs has put on uh, seed money for uh, 15,000 euros uh, for the uh, winning team uh, with um, with uh, uh, one important clause for them as they are um, uh, developing a new um, building uh, register uh, for the buildings and there will be new functionalities then uh, they expect that the team who wins uh, has done some integration to the upcoming uh, uh, version of the building register so uh, that's the only term they have in order to get the seed money and there will there will be also it's uh, in this point when we record this, uh, it's not yet officially published, but there will be another prize uh, out for a challenge uh, put together in uh, one real estate company called Estonian Rigi uh, Kinisvara. It's like a real estate company uh, um, called um, up or put together by the governmental uh, organizations. So they manage all the real estate and they have also their own challenge, which uh, they look for a solution and they have put uh, 3,000 euros as, as a price for their challenge. Uh, well, the event will take place uh, on, from 25th till 27th of um, September and the signing up uh, page is uh, garage48.org and uh, the event is Garage 48 Digital Construction 2020. So all the information is uh, is found there. How to register, and how to put up your ideas, etc. And Paul, are there any interesting things coming up in the UK? Yeah, there are lots of events coming up in the UK, but um, I started with an item um, related to the UK BIM Alliance. I think I'll finish with an item about the UK BIM Alliance. Um, they hold quarterly forum meetings and the next quarterly forum is coming up on the 29th of September. It will, as is normal in our COVID-19 times, be an online event. So you are able to register and attend the event and hear an update on what the UK Alliance has been up to, uh, including uh, an update from one of the authors of the uh, ISO 19650 part three guidance. Thanks, Paul. And thanks also to our contributors, Paul Doherty, Nicholas Holst, Robert Salvador, and Martin Polycarpus. And thank you for watching AC Tech TV. Yes, thank you for watching. And remember, you can contact us via the website, through email, follow us on Twitter, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for, for watching, and goodbye. And goodbye from me.